welcome to Term Talk. I'm Jim Chance, Senior Judicial Education Attorney with the Judicial and Legal Education Division at the Federal Judicial Center. In each of our eight to 12 minute episodes, we discuss what lower courts need to know about this term's most impactful Supreme Court decisions. Joining me are our longtime collaborators, Laurie Levinson, Professor of Law and David W. Burcham Chair in Ethical Advocacy at Loyola Law School, and Evan Lee, Professor Emeritus at University of California Law, San Francisco. Thank you both for joining us again. Today, we're talking about another decision in which the court discusses the limits of executive power. This is the case of United States versus Texas. It was brought by Texas and Louisiana to challenge the Department of Homeland Security's authority to prioritize immigration enforcement policies. In U.S. versus Texas, standing was an important issue. Laurie, can you start us off with the Texas case, please? Absolutely, Jim. This was an eight to one decision with Justice Alito writing the sole dissent here. And it involved in 2021 that Secretary of the Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas had promulgated some new guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration law. He prioritized some circumstances requiring arrest and detention over others. But that's when Texas and Louisiana challenged that prioritization as the under-enforcement of some of the provisions. They said that the statutes required the Department of Homeland Security to arrest more individuals, more criminal non-citizens pending their removal under, than it was under these guidelines. And that they alleged that the guidelines themselves created additional costs for the states because they still must bring the arrest and they needed to provide services to these non-citizens. So this case goes to the district court. The district court found that there was economic injury that supported standing. The court found that the guidelines were unlawful and the court vacated those guidelines under the Administrative Procedure Act. It then went to the Fifth Circuit, which declined to stay the lower court's decision. But it finally made its way to the Supreme Court, where Justice Kavanaugh, writing for the majority, said that, in fact, the plaintiffs, Texas and Louisiana, lack standing. And Evan, what was the court's analysis, please? Well, the court somewhat surprisingly rested its decision very heavily on a single precedent, uh, Linda R.S. versus Richard D., uh, 1973, uh, which was a five to four opinion written by Justice Thurgood Marshall, um, somewhat unusually uh, going along with um, four of his conservative colleagues. And along the way, in finding no standing in that case, um, Justice Marshall's opinion stated, and I quote, a citizen lacks standing to contest the policies of the prosecuting authority when he himself is neither prosecuted nor threatened with prosecution, end quote. Now, this is a statement that over the years has widely been regarded as dicta rather than strictly necessary to the result in that case, but it is relied upon quite heavily um, by the majority in U.S. versus Texas. In this case, the court says the states have, and again, I quote, no cognizable interest in procuring enforcement of the immigration laws, end quote. The majority goes on to say that the executive branch has near absolute discretion to decide whether to arrest a suspect, whether to prosecute a case, whether to remove uh, a non-citizen, and that the executive branch is in a better position to balance the um, competing costs and interests um, as opposed to the judiciary. So, Laurie, there was a the concurrence in this case from Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, Thomas and Barrett. Uh, what did that add? And then there was a lone dissent, I believe, from Justice Alito. You can talk to us about that as well. Oh, let me start with that concurrence. They agree that there's lack of standing, but they say it's on the basis of the third prong of standing, that the requested relief was not likely to redress the harm, that it's speculative, frankly, whether more arrests would result actually in the cost savings that the states were claiming. So that was part of the concurrence. Yeah. And then if I could just jump in, uh, Justice Gorsuch spends considerable time 
questioning whether the district court's order vacating the guidelines under Section 706 sub 2 of the Administrative Procedures Act was proper. Um, this is clearly an important point for him. He said that the vacator in this case acted in the same way that a universal injunction acts, which is to say it's applicable to everyone, whether you're a party to the case or not. And he argued that vacator under 706 sub 2 of the APA should merely be treated as the disregard or the looking past, if you will, of an allegedly illegal agency action for purposes of the case at bar, but not as a striking down of an agency action nationwide for all time. You asked about the dissent, Jim, and yes. that was Justice Alito who wrote that lone dissent, but he wanted to make this strong point that he thought the administrations, as he called it, abdication of duty should be actionable and that they should not have to wait until there's redress through Congress or even the polls. All right. So what are the takeaways? Evan? Um, I, Justice Kavanaugh appears to be keeping this decision as narrow as possible, uh, not wanting to get into an area where there's a lot of uh, precedent, that is to say the law of redressability, um, and certainly not wanting to get into the appropriateness of universal injunctions and the appropriateness of vacator under the APA or how vacator ought to be regarded. But because he leaves those issues aside, it would not be surprising to see the court take up some or all of those matters in um, future cases. What do you think, Lori? I agree. You know, it's worth noting and probably watching that the three concurring justices signaled that the Supreme Court's 2007 decision, which, by the way, was a five to four decision in Massachusetts versus EPA, which found that states deserve a, quote, special solicitude in standing analysis may no longer be viable. In fact, Justice Gorsuch writes, quote, it's hard not to wonder why the court says nothing about special solicitude in this case. And it's hard not to think too, that lower courts should just leave that idea on the shelf in future ones. Excellent. Thank you both again for joining us today. We will see you next time.